Good morning. Uh, my name is Elise and I am um, a licensed professional counselor with Counseling Care Circle. We are hosting a project for accessibility and empowerment of AAPI, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Uh, today, as my guest interviewee, I have my friend Rebecca who works in the nonprofit space. And um, I just have a couple questions for you. Welcome, Rebecca. It's nice to have you. Thanks, Elise. Good to be here. Thanks for having <laughs> me. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, for the first question, you know, since you work in the nonprofit industry and you've been doing that for several years now, um, a lot of Asian immigrants don't really understand, you know, it, coming into a new country in general for anyone of any background, it's hard to suddenly understand the system, right? Whether it's for-profit spaces or nonprofit spaces or where to get resources, how to connect to community, all these different things. And so going into the nonprofit sector to either go in as a client or work in that space and try to build a career because they share ideals and, and values with the people in the nonprofit space. Um, sometimes Asians and Asian immigrants or their kids even who haven't really been prepared for it by parents that don't really understand the system can naturally get overwhelmed or intimidated trying to navigate the nonprofit world. And, um, and so that leads to my first question, how does your industry, your nonprofit world, um, and I know you can't speak to every single nonprofit out there, but from your experience, how does your industry try to help um, Asians and Pacific Islanders navigate the industry? How do they try to help Asians and Pacific Islanders understand them? Yeah, so I would say in my own experience, um, and like you said, I can't speak for every nonprofit, but um, unfortunately, there's not that much focus on um, having recruiting or serving, servicing um, uh, Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders. We can just use AAPI if that's okay with you, yeah. um, just because that will be long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so with my, um, yeah, my experience, I would say that I, I've seen, a, like I've seen nonprofits um, do a lot more like work towards like diversity and inclusion and that's one thing I really love about nonprofits because of the human work that we're able to do and often that's between um, whites and black that's all that's typically the conversation and and I mean I have like yeah and so I think that's great but often I've seen a lot of conversations miss um talking about other groups um and as someone who um identifies with multiple racial identities i can see like it's it feels very torn when um one one part of my identity asian identity doesn't isn't like seen or isn't talked about and so as far as like staff um, recruitment or retention with nonprofits, in my experience, like that really hasn't been the focus, um, especially. And and uh, yeah, and then I would say with servicing, there's not really an opportunity for um, Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders to be like serviced, at least in my experience. Mm, yeah, thank you so much for sharing from your experience, Rebecca. Um, I really appreciate your insider perspective. So, you know, hearing that there are, um, you know, it, it, that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are not always thought or in, thought of and considered in um, special programs for them and kind of just looped in into the bigger scheme, but not really considered as, mm -hmm. a, as a valid voice or experience in that process of design. Um, it leads me to ask to think about a couple other questions. So, what are the industry standards, you know, just across the board when it comes to like laws and ethics for providing language interpreters to AAPI clients and visitors in the nonprofit sector? Um, what are the industry standards for reasonable accommodations for AAPI with disabilities and 
other serious challenges. Maybe there's protocol or certain forms that insiders are aware of, but somebody coming into it might not have any idea, oh, I need to fill this out to then get accessibility mm -hmm. and, and um, communication assistance. Yeah. Um, so when I think of that, I'm just thinking of like professional standards and um, like language that that organizations use to um, include AAPI. Is that what you're kind of asking? Because that's kind of like where my mind is thinking. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're the industry professional. Yeah. So I'll go with it <laughs> wherever you go. Yeah, I mean, I think um, with what I what I've seen and experienced, there's. I mean, I wouldn't say it's generic language, but I will, would also say that <laughs> I think the standard, the professional standard is um, typically like what you would see, um, but a little bit, yeah, typically what you would see, like probably in a business world, I'm not very familiar with like business worlds, but and more like nonprofits, um, but, but also a little more like refined, more inclusive. And I, like, I wouldn't even say there's, I mean, okay, that, well, yeah. And then, and, and then also I'm thinking of like documents that, um, that like maybe like language accommodations or like documents that need to be like translated. And, and I mean, it makes sense that like the next translation is Spanish because we have a lot of Spanish speakers. And then after that would be like Mandarin. Um, or like depending on like in Columbus now there's more actually yeah there are more there are more Asian immigrants from different countries here in the city the city like that have been immigrating these past few years and so I'm seeing those accommodations being um, given more and more um, as the need arises um, but I don't think that yeah I think that like businesses and like just like the like the workspace is very slow to um, provide any of that and, until it's like a bigger need, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I think, you know, it's really curious. It's a good point that you're making that your experiences in the Midwest, in Ohio, yeah. Central Ohio. So the population is a little different here versus what it might look like in another state. So um, certain places may have caught up to speed based on their population. It sounds like if I'm hearing you correctly that the population and the population actually showing up plays a really big role as to whether the accommodations are even created or considered. Yeah. So it's more of like a response instead of like, a, oh, I see you and therefore let me welcome you. Yeah, and, I, and I've had experiences with um, there's so many nonprofits, there's different like areas that serve communities. And I've been in different ones where there's been education or like a religious nonprofit. And I think based off of like, who are we servicing? I do, I have seen um, like, for example, yeah, I, I don't know if I should share an example, but I have seen like, um, or actually I will share <laughs> just because <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, but with some like religious organizations that I've been part of, like we know that they're, um, especially like young people who come to the US, they come here to study. They, a lot of them are, um, come from like Eastern Asia, East Asia, Asian countries. And um, like, I've seen how, so I would say I've seen some nonprofits who really do like think of the group that they are like reaching out to um, do a lot of better job of like pro professionally, like um, making sure that whoever they are welcoming have, like they can see that there are accommodations for them, that they're being welcomed, that they're being seen. And that's what I really do appreciate about um, just like, yeah, that, that sector in general that, um, there is a way to like make it a little more individualized for like who you who you know that you're gonna like be seeing or reaching out to or servicing. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
So if I understand you correctly, there are some, like, it sounds like some religious nonprofit organizations that are more um, preemptive about these, about the Asian American and, and Pacific Islander populations, whereas like the non-religious from your experience has been a bit more res- reactive maybe or responsive to um, the volume of requests. Um, when, when the volume grows, is, is that accurate? Yeah, yes, I would say, yeah. Mm, okay, yeah, that's really helpful to know too. That may give a clue or at least, you know, somewhere to start for someone who's just looking for support. If they're new, if they're in, an immigrant, maybe a better place for them to start reaching out to could be a, yeah. a religiously based nonprofit organization, um, yeah. possibly. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think a lot of it, I'm not sure if this project is just for the U.S. or just Ohio. It, is it? Oh, well, <laughs> it's, it's kind of open, you know. It's yeah. like we can only speak from where we are, right? Like we can't try to talk about things we've never yeah, experienced true. or don't know anything about. But yeah, I, I'm hoping that it can be um, somewhere to start to at least get some idea of well, what are some general kind of things that a person could encounter in Ohio or in the Midwest or yeah. in the U.S.? Like, I, I think even like venturing beyond the Midwest, it, like it, the culture yeah. suddenly shifts, right? That's so, so true. I don't think I would venture out to say this is an international thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, um, I just love that you're speaking from where you are and we can, we can try to help bring each other up, right? Like instead of mm-hmm. like flying over each other to try to get somewhere we can help bring each yeah. other along. So, um, yeah, so that kind of leads then to my next question. Um, what are some direct opportunities available in your industry to empower Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders? For example, um, have you, as a, as an industry professional, have you encountered mentoring? Um, is there a diversity network of leadership um, mm-hmm. in the places where you've worked or when you look at, you know, other organizations, nonprofits that you admire and keep up to date with? Um, how much AAPI representation is there at the C-suite, you know, like way at the top? Mm-hmm. Um, are there scholarships available to AAPI to enter that industry, you know, through um, scholarships for for college or um, yeah whatever. So, no, these are a lot of questions, but you can just run with whatever <laughs> yeah. resonates for you. Yeah. I always, I do think that the many spaces that I've been part of or worked in always have a hope to like have as much representation and as far as like leadership or like participants or, or whatever that is. Um, and as far as for me, like I've always like, I think I've always been welcomed um, as somebody who like embodies different um, identities, and um, yeah, and there's always been like, yeah, um, my requests and and whatever ways I've wanted to grow, like as a leader or as a participant, have always been like. Um, received well and yeah and so I'm actually really thankful that I've never really had to in the workplace at at least um, had to or or felt like I was denied of anything or that there weren't any like possibilities for me to grow if I wanted to Um, and I think um, as far as like leadership um I'm very thankful that I've also been in spaces where a lot of leaders are people of color. I do have like one uh, mentor right now um, and like a few leader, few leaders at the very top who, who are um, like people of color. Um, though I've also experienced where that's not been the case. And I think thinking back, like just reflecting on these con- this conversation, like it is important to like, know like where you live like know the population um because it does change and like there are different needs and and all that and just yeah I don't know like it's not it's not necessarily always a like an organization's fault or anything like I think there's always that desire 
but like sometimes like the people aren't there like the people aren't like interested interested in working in this nonprofit or maybe they are working in it but just not here or you know so um that's where my mind went <laughs> yeah yeah i'm curious um what you know i'm really glad to hear that you've had access to opportunities like i feel like that's really coming through from what you shared about your personal experience yeah. and that people are supportive of you that they haven't denied you that they try to give you good examples mm -hmm. of um mentors and that they actually connect with you so that's just yeah. beautiful um, I'm curious, were there like official programs that like had diversity mm -hmm. trainings or, um, diversity mentorship or, um, opportunities where like women help women up or, um, mm -hmm. people of color help people, people like, is there anything like that in the workspace or was it more like your own connections with the people were, were wonderful and they were mm -hmm. mentors for you? Yeah. Um, I would say part of it is the relationships I had. And I would say there's also, there's been like spaces for um, like diversity groups, I guess you could say um, for like one another. I, I would, and I don't think I've, I don't think there's been a fellowship that I've been part of where that was um, Part of it but I think um a few places like a few places where I've worked at um and especially like these past like the, these past five years since I've been like working um like a lot of places are kind of in the either in the beginning or like kind of the middle like beginning to middle of like making sure their their place of work is a place of diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. um and so I would love to see like in the future, like where we go from there. Cause I think a lot of places are just starting, you know, just starting that. You know, that's a really cool thing that I want to ask more about. Like I didn't plan this question, but it's, it's great to hear um, that there are ways to benchmark progress, right? So when you're saying that there's like beginning and the middle and there's an implied end, so like a beginning middle stage for these groups in trying to become their end goal of being a, a self-aware um, group that celebrates human life and all its diversity on staff and who they service. What does, like, how would you, how would you define that beginning and middle stage? Mm, yeah, I think beginning um well there yeah I would say beginning when you're really starting it is you create a space for um people of color to have a place where they can start the conversation or like input their voice somewhere like there's a an, an actual space where people can actually do that um and and that and that be led by people of color. And I've seen where a lot of times that hasn't worked out well. People start off wrong because, like, they create a space, but like a, a white person is leading that. Mm. And, um, and yeah. So I would say I've been, I've been in a, so like most places have been at that beginning stage where the conversation starts. And then the middle and um, yeah, the middle is where like policies and and laws or, or rules or whatever that is start to change. Like you make recommendations to change policies and systems. Um, and that probably takes like the most time. And I would say right now where, where I am at, like with where, where I'm working with at right now, like they're in the middle, like, and there's so many things to change. There will always be so many things to change, <laughs> I feel like. That's probably one of the hardest parts, right? It's kind of yeah. like, here's your childhood. And then here's like crazy adolescence when like yeah. all your hormones are like crazy and everyone's feeling everything. I'm kind of yeah. using a, a metaphor right now, but like 
it's, it's yeah. hard to be in that middle stage as an organization because everyone feels all different things. And then they yeah. all have perspectives and you're all trying to navigate it together. And somebody feels like they know more than someone else. Somebody's feelings get hurt and it can yeah. it's like a stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. Yeah. <laughs> as yeah. you're getting there. Yeah. Before you mature into that end stage. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for kind of like fleshing that out, you know, of, of what you've observed, um, making space, making room at the table mm-hmm. for conversation, for being present, for the experiences to be held is pretty key to having mutual understanding, even have a chance right. um, at growing. Yeah. So, you know, since you were able to see some of that, like, beginning stage where it's like exciting, maybe a little scary, but kind of exciting that like beginning stage and then the middle stage too. I'm curious um, to hear from your perspective, what are some of the um, challenges that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders uniquely face in your industry that are not shared with other minority groups? Mm -hmm. Uh, Or even with, you know, it's, or even like with a dominant group, but like members of a dominant group that are part of a minority group. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, what are some of those unique things that you think are, are true to Asian people, but sometimes because other people don't have those experiences, they might not even see the challenges. Mm, yeah. I find, um, yeah, I would say like, just one thing is fearing, uh, like, speaking up for their like I, I don't know I wouldn't say like in my experience I've seen more times than not um Asians being the first to like speak up on their experience um in a in a in a group of like other people of color and or yeah or just any group <laughs> and um and I, I I don't know maybe now maybe I'm getting I don't know. I don't want to like be stereotypical, but <laughs> uh, here, yeah, here I am just like, yeah, trying to like regulate myself. Cause I know like, I, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. This is just like a real moment of me. Like, I mean, I, I also have to like work through things that I have to like, yeah, assumptions or, or whatever that um, of other people that I might have. So I'm just going to call that out for myself <laughs> but um you're my friend I'm not gonna say whatever <laughs> about you <laughs> well I was I was just gonna say like um I don't even know what I was gonna say actually <laughs> I guess sometimes talking about challenges that we share can be a little bit vulnerable right like it can be a little bit exposing and then if we don't know that everyone else is feeling it, it can be a yeah. little bit nerve wracking. Yeah. And like, and like, even now, like, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't know, maybe, and maybe this happens, but like, maybe like Asians or AAPI may not be like, may not want to share because they don't want to like undermine another person of color is like experience like even though it's different and it's not always um it's not it's not the like a problem that's always like a challenge that's always seen like it still matters I guess so I don't even know what I was gonna say I'm so sorry (laughs) (laughs) it's okay um yeah just the original question was basically what are some unique challenges faced by AAPI in your industry whether they're the clients or you know, the professionals, um, and, I uh, and then it just kind of felt vulnerable to talk about the challenges, I guess. Yeah. You know, a part of you is Asian, so it, it's okay that it feels vulnerable. And sometimes, you know, I run into this a lot with, with my work as well as just like being a friend <laughs> is like, sometimes like talking about vulnerable things, can kind of freeze up your mind because yeah. it's like, oh my gosh, that's my, that's my soft place. And, um, if I know that somebody else is soft place and it's a friend of mine, then I'm like, I want to protect it too. Yeah. So, you know, it's okay that you're like kind of freezing up that you're not totally sure what to say. You know, we can just leave it at that and that 
sometimes the challenges are hard to say. And I, mm-hmm. and I think that, you know, when I, um, cause I kind of work in an industry where people tell me secrets, right? Like that's what mental mm-hmm. health is. So like when people come to therapy, they tell your secrets and then they like work through the, the stuff yeah. that feels stuck in the secrets. Yeah. Right. So I guess this is where I can like kind of share that, um, when I encounter people telling me, um, some of these, things that are really, really hard related to their racial experiences. Mm -hmm. It can be difficult to speak up for themselves, but it feels so much easier to speak up for someone else. Mm -hmm. And like, if you see it and you know about it, then you can call it out. And when there's like a number of people who feel the same way and you have a collective group that are not speaking up or because of stereotypes that exist, even when somebody does speak up, they get silenced or ignored then everyone else who's experienced the same thing as the person that spoke up, but got ignored, they're like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but it's like, oh, there's another time that we get ignored. And, and so like a part of it is like, you know, people just, some people are like have selective hearing Mm. and, um, and that's because of their own stuff. Right. And it's not just purely like, oh, they're a bad person they're biased, but like, but they have their own staff. They're human. So some people have selective hearing and then some people have like a difficulty in like when they perceive and they can see that they're being selectively silenced out, then Mm. it's hard to overcome that part um, to have a conversation. And then it's, it's, becomes challenging to even address the challenges, right? (laughs) Like it's a double challenge over the same thing. So, um, and then it just gets more complicated. So, um, yeah, maybe that's a conversation for another day, but that's okay. You know, we can just untangle it as we go along Mm -hmm. today's main purpose for the interview was talking about accessibility and empowerment. Um, you've given us some like really great ideas, tools, encouragement for, working in and approaching the nonprofit industry that if there's an API immigrant, somebody who doesn't really know the language or whatever, they might get better services, at least in the Midwest through religiously based organizations that would want to work with them more immediately than like, you know, just being one number in a crowd that the, that the organization has to respond to. Um, So they might get more success that way. And that developing the relationships has been very helpful for you. So that gives a little bit of encouragement for others that, hey, developing the relationships might might go well for you too. And there may be some programming for diversity and mentorship, but may not be. And it may like it may lay more in the the relationships themselves. Am I hearing you correctly from yeah, today? definitely. And I wanted to say, yeah, thank you for um like what you pointed out from. The other question I didn't really yeah I definitely think I was like freezing up and I wondered why and I think you just like worded it so well and I think it goes to that challenge of like not being confident at least for me like in my voice like does my experience even really is it valid and I think just you sharing like responding how you responded like I think like yes you you help make uh, people's voices valid by just doing this um, project. So I do really, uh, or well, they're valid anyway. But um, yeah, so I just want to say like, thank you for that. And um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's part of being a job, a, a friend, right? That's the job yeah. of a friend is to lift each other up and lift each other's voices up. Because like you said, it's already valid. Sometimes yeah. you just need a little cheerleader, a little hype team. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, um, in closing, I have an option for you. I have two different questions. You can choose which one you like, or if you like both, you can do both. Um, the first question is, you know, this project was born out of a motivation to help empower the public, especially AAPI with accessibility information. Um, so it, it was, it was, it's, it's, uh, born motivated because the Georgia murders of um, several Asian women um, who work in an industry that is historically very complicated in its associations with the sex industry and um, Asians, uh, race, race, racist stereotypes against Asian people and um, just the way that 
world economies developed after the world wars. There's a lot of complexity there. So um, that's why accessibility has been the, the motivation of this particular interview project. And um, anyhow, so if you have any thoughts that you wanna share in conclusion about accessibility, um, that's one question. The second question is, if you wanted to share anything of your personal thoughts or reflections after hearing about the Georgia incident and how it's being handled, you're welcome to share that as well. Um, up to you, whichever way you want to go. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, and I've definitely done some reflection these past few days about how, like, my response towards um, what happened in Atlanta. And at first, and I think, um, yeah, just like as someone who embodies different, two different racial identities, I worked through a lot of things over this last summer and over this year with um, a lot of like uh, police brutality and just um, deaths with death of um, black people. And, and then this on top of it, I, I think I just like was like okay I'm numb and I think it's just good to um reflect I think it's just I'm glad that I had many friends who helped me reflect on this because I think I was going to stay in that numb space if I wasn't if I didn't process it and I think the layer after that was um anger obviously um and then under the anger was hurt mm -hmm. and I think um in my, in my, um, yeah, and just like a lot of things that have been just like, kind of like similar to what I was saying with um, like the, where I'm working right now, like the, we're in the middle stages. So people are sharing or like, you know, we're just like experimenting, like, what is this? How do we have these conversations? Um, and with, with what was happening this week and with conversations I was ha having with people and with how people are responding on social media and friends and all that, like to me, I've just continued to see um, like us, like solidarity in people of color, which I'm so appreciative of that. Like, I think that is how, like, like we, we should be coming together. Like, that's how, like, I feel that we were created, you know, like to be there for one another. And kind of what you said, like uh, as friends, like lift one another up. And I and I guess maybe this I just have seen like white silence a little bit more this time, and I'm not really sure. Well, actually, or maybe I that's not true. I've I've seen it's just like a it's another it's another new thing for white people to be surprised about or to learn about, and and I just I think my response <laughs> if I could say one thing is that I think I would just continue to encourage white people to do the work um, and encourage um, white uh, people to encourage other white people because I, I think as a person of color like doing this this work for myself it's get it gets tiring and I do love the um, solidarity and all that but I just think like, there's like I just feel like we're in such a place where unfortunately it's normalized but like all these things are happening like racial hate like hate um hate crimes and I just think like there should not be any excuse for white people not to to not respond so that was kind of a little direct and harsh but I think the more I learn like how like my voice means something like I just I really think like we need white people to do to do their work too yeah yeah for sure um we all have a lot of work to do <laughs> and it starts with just a little bit of bravery each day so um thank you so much for setting a model setting a tone showing up today, sharing, trying to make your industry and its services more accessible to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. 
Thank you for calling out what needs to be done. And, um, and that the black white binary is not inclusive of AAPI. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for the ways that you showed up today. And, um, and with that, we'll conclude this little chat. And, uh, and, and uh, next time we'll have another interview in this project uh, from a different industry professional. Thanks everyone and see you later. Bye.